Greetings on this beautiful Sunday afternoon. Uh, I'm a little late with my lesson, but uh, we will get started in just a moment. Before we do, I'd like to commend Chris on his leadership as our pastor in getting us together yesterday and for everybody that showed up to get so many things done. It showed that <clears throat> he's definitely taking the leadership and uh, as our pastor. So thank you, Chris. Thank you, everybody. I hope that uh, everybody is looking forward to starting uh, back to church. Hopefully we can get everything done back into the uh, district superintendent in time to start on the 28th. And uh, with that in mind, uh, I will not be here on the 28th. Uh, I'm taking my grandson backpacking. So we're going to the Great Smoky Mountains. So we'll be up high and close to God. So we'll worship on that, uh, that particular day in the Smokies. Uh, one other thing, uh, I do want to remind everybody that um, uh, you can mail your ties in to uh, Glenn. Uh, bills still go on even though we're not meeting in the, the structure itself. With that in mind, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day that you've given us to serve you. Thank you for the leadership that uh, Chris takes as our pastor. And thank you for each and every member that steps up to the plate to get things done. Pray that uh, everything will go smooth, that we'll be able to uh, start on the 28th, that you'll protect everybody and keep us safe and remind us that we have to follow the guidelines. Uh, we do come before you in, during this particular time with this uh, virus going around. Praying, Lord, that you'll uh, find a, uh, that you'll lead our uh, researchers uh, in a way that they can find a uh, treatment for this particular virus and a vaccine before this fall. And we're just asking you to just take it away. Remind us during this time that you're always in charge, that you are always uh, there with us. You promised you would never leave us nor forsake us. And we're going to rest on that and rest on the assurance that we're in your hands each and every day. Guide and direct us. Help us to be stronger Christians each and every day. And may we lift up praise to you and bring glory to your name. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, today we continue our study of the Sermon on the Mount. We're still in the section dealing with various parts of the Old Testament law. Remember that the purpose of Jesus uh, teaching his disciples in this particular instance is uh, to reveal the true meaning behind the various parts of the Old Testament law. He stated that unless our righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, we cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. We have thus far looked at murder, adultery, and oaths. Today we deal with the matter of justice and revenge. This is contained in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 42. Uh, listen as I read this scripture this, morning, this day. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. For whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you. And do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. This teaching actually goes counter to every fiber of our being and our culture. Uh, most of us, at the time, we really don't want justice. We want revenge. I've read accounts of uh, incidences where a family member was killed and the Christian family actually visited the murder in prison and forgave them. I have to say this is tough and uh, took a lot of, of guts and a lot of love, and this is only the kind of love that can come from God. In all actuality, most movies around this theme are centered on revenge. So what was Jesus trying to tell the disciples in this section of his teaching? We cannot honestly answer this question without looking at the context of the situation 
and then look at other uh, commands of Scripture. So let's plow right into this today. First of all, let's go back to the Old Testament teachings. In the Old Testament, uh, it taught justice or an eye for an eye. In verse 38, it said, You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. This refers back to a section of the Old Testament law that is often called the lex talonis, or law of retaliation, or the law of the tooth. We can find it mentioned three times in the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 21, verse 24, in Leviticus chapter 24, verse 20, and Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 21. So was personal revenge the intent of this law? Well, let's examine this just a little bit further. Let me read to you Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 16 through 21. It says as follows, If a malicious witness rises up against a man to accuse him of wrongdoing, then both the men who have the dispute shall stand before the Lord, before the priest and the judges, who will be in office in these days. The judges will investigate thoroughly and it will be a witness if the witness is a false witness and he has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him just as he had intended to do to his brother. Thus you shall purge the evil from among you. The rest will hear and be afraid and will never again do such an evil thing among you. Thus you shall not show pity. Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So what was the original intention of this particular law? First, it meant that excessive punishment was prohibited. It did not give permission to take revenge on someone, but it was accomplished to limit the punishment that could be given. As such, the law accomplished two things. First of all, the punishment fit the crime. The idea was that no excessive punishment could be meted out. The law promoted justice and not revenge. The second thing is, is that evil was restrained. Uh, the, this law was to accomplish and restrain evil. Deuteronomy 19 verses, 20, uh, verses 16 through 21 explained this that we read prior to this. Another point of the law was to forbid, forbid personal revenge. Listen to Deuteronomy 12.35, which says, Vengeance is mine, and retribution in due time their foot will slip. For the day of their calamity is near, and the impending things are hastening upon them. And then next I'd like to read to you from Romans chapter 12, verse 19, as Paul penned. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, thus saith the Lord. Note again that personal revenge was forbidden. So what was supposed to happen then? Well, first of all, notice that the law applied to judges and courts. Uh, we, this point was to let the courts do their job. But if this was the case, why did Jesus address this? Well, because the Pharisees and other leaders were extending this teaching to personal relationships. They weren't limiting it to the courts, as the scripture says, but they were giving personal permission to exact the same punishment allowed under the law by the offending party. In other words, the Pharisees and the leaders at that time said, if somebody uh, hits you upside the head, you can hit them upside the head. If they cut your arm off, you can cut their arm off. So it was meat for meat. In other words, they were bypassing the court system. But notice what our passage in Deuteronomy and Romans said. It said that God would repay. So in the context of this Old Testament law, it said that excessive punishment was prohibited and personal revenge was prohibited. If this was the case, then what was Jesus teaching? Well, back to verse 19 of our lesson, Jesus said, But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. The Greek word for resist is uh, anthistami, 
Uh, it literally means I set against or I withstand or resist or oppose. So who does this apply to and to whom was this addressed? Well, first of all, it was spoken to individuals in their personal relationships. Does this mean that we should not resist evil at all? Well, Leo Tolstoy uh, used this passage of Jesus to argue that we should get rid of the military, the courts, and the police force totally, and that we should just let evil play itself out on its own and leave it all in God's hand. So what do you think of Tolstoy's argument? I think it's foolish myself. Well, let's go back and see what Jesus really was saying. Jesus is talking to individuals and their personal relationships. He is saying that there should be no Christian vigilantes, no taking the law into our own hands, no trying to get even with others. Jesus says something that is one of the hardest things, for me at least, to personally do, and that's just love them back. That's difficult, isn't it? One thing we need to note, that there is a different set of scriptural commands for governments, for courts, military, police, and other law enforcement. It's recorded in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 4, and it says, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except Jesus, or except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinances of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a curse of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is the minister of God for you to do, do good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is the minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. So, <clears throat> it's the government's job to resist evil in society. The courts should punish the lawmakers, the military should protect their country, and the police should arrest criminals, which seems to be counter to our society and what I see going on today. And that disturbs me deeply. If you use the court system to resist evil, it should not be done with the motive of revenge. Even if you personally forgive someone, you may still prosecute them but out of love for society and the common good of society. I think this is spelled out in Romans. Love for your neighbor requires uh, prosecution of the criminal. After all, what if a criminal uh, is running around loose and you say, oh, I'm just going to let them go. And then they go next door and shoot your neighbor. Have you really practiced love for your neighbor? <clears throat> Here's how Martin Luther puts it. No Christian shall wield or invoke the sword for himself in his cause. In behalf of another, however, he may and should wield it and evoke it to restrain wickedness and to defend godliness. Also, Thomas Stott said and then wrote, A Christian may prosecute a criminal out of love for, to public justice, though not from private revenge. So justice is given over to the courts, but Jesus took it one step further. He commands that we as Christians practice radical love over revenge. And now comes the confession. This is one of the most difficult things we have covered thus far for me. Most of us want revenge. We want to get even. We want to take the law in our own hands. We want to do things, and especially if you... Uh, have a military background and you have a military mindset, there are certain things that are set forth in your mind. And so this is difficult. But he does not, it doesn't come natural to us and in turn to turn the other cheek or to stand there and let somebody lambast us. But really, do you have to do that? Well, we'll see in a minute. But that is not what Jesus taught. He gave us four examples of radical love over revenge. First, 
One is personal insult or turn the other cheek. And that's found in the last part of verse 39. He actually says, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Why the right cheek? Well, it refers to a backhanded slap on the face in Jesus' time and still is in the Middle East today. Such a guest gesture was the highest form of contempt. The gesture is a grave insult and not a physical attack. We may have other grave insults in our own culture, but in this particular culture, this was a personal and a grave insult. Once again, we need to note that this verse does not prohibit self-defense or protecting others from harm. Perhaps a more modern example of this type of insult is when someone calls you a name or puts you down face to face or behind your back. What did Jesus say to do? Turn the other cheek. The second thing Jesus said was to avoid lawsuits. He said, let him have your cloak also. In verse 40, he says, if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Now, Jesus moves from unjust actions against your person to unjust actions against your possessions. To put it in perspective, the tunic was the undergarment and the cloak was the outer garment. By law, you could take someone's tunic, but you could not take someone's cloak or outer garment. Why? The reason was they used the cloak as a blanket at night. So what was Jesus saying? That we should be willing to sacrifice our own rights in order to reach out in love to other people. We do that in our sacrificial giving and many acts of kindness that we do as Christians. But once again, <clears throat> let's put things in perspective and balance it with other scripture. For instance, 1 Timothy 5, 8 reminds us that we have a scriptural obligation to take care of our family. If you had to go to court to protect your livelihood and your family is in jeopardy, it's your scriptural obligation. Third thing Jesus talked about was forced actions. Verse 41 simply says, if someone forces you to go one mile, go with him the two miles. During the era of Jesus and the, G the Jews were under Roman occupation and the Roman soldiers had the right to stop anybody on the road at any time and force them to carry their belongings, but only for a prescribed distance. Uh, it was actually what would be considered a mile in that time, not necessarily a mile in our own uh, measurement system. But can you imagine the humiliation of being forced to carry your enemy's equipment? But Jesus is saying, go the extra mile so that the debt is paid in full and show them radical love over revenge. Then we come to the fourth uh, point Jesus was making, honoring a quest or giving to the one who asks you. This is how he puts it in verse 42. He says, give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. From the point that uh, we're directed now to Proverbs uh, chapter 3, verse 27, which says, do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is your uh, power to, to act. In other words, if we have the means to do so, we should not hold uh, the good from another person. We also are once again in need of balancing this with other scriptures. Jesus is not saying if someone asks for your house, you should give them your house. In all actuality, the psalmist put it this way in Psalm 112, verse 5. He said, Good will come to him who is generous and lends freely, who conducts his affairs with justice. Here the word justice speaks of wisdom and discernment. Be generous, but be wise and discerning. For example, for example it's not wise, uh, and it doesn't make good sense to give money to a drug addict if you know they're going down to get another hit and get some more drugs and uh, get it from their dealer. However, if their family is going hungry, the wise thing to do 
as, uh, as, as the psalmist would put it, is to take them food directly to the family and not to the attic. Uh, I know that I've seen a lot of churches and a lot of people that have benevolent giving. If somebody comes and says, I'm hungry, they made arrangements with McDonald's or some other restaurant out there and they'll give them a, uh, a slip and they say, you can take this down and get a free meal. Well, if they're looking for drugs, they're not going to do it anyway. They'll tear it up. If they're really hungry. They'll take advantage of that. And so that is an example. The Hebrew word for justice is mishpat. It occurs in various forms more than 200 times in the Hebrew Old Testament. Its most basic meaning is to treat people with e equitably. Uh, in other words, treat everybody as equal. It means acquitting or punishing every person on the merits of the case, regardless of race or social status. Anyone who does the same wrong should be given the same penalty. Mishpat means more than just the punishment of wrongdoing. It also means giving people their rights. Deuteronomy 18 directs that the priests of the tabernacle should be supported by a certain percentage of the people's income. This support is described as the priest mishpat, which means their due or their right. Mishpat then is giving people what they are due, whether punishment, protection, or care. Paul expresses this in a more direct terms in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. Here he says, if a man will not work, he shall not eat. The idea is that we should not encourage laziness. Notice the response of Peter and John in Acts chapter 3, verse 6. The beggar asked him for some money, and their reply was, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. So the overall point of Jesus' teaching here is that Christians should never try to get even or get back to another person. Rather, we should practice radical love over revenge. So there's three applications that I'm going to conclude with, and I'm not going to expand on them. I'll give you some scriptures, and hopefully you'll take the time to look up the scriptures and <clears throat> come to your own conclusions and, and uh, do your own uh, diligence with this. So here we are. Number one, practice mercy rather than justice. Read James 3, 13 and Matthew 5, 7. Again, James 3, 13 and Matthew 5, 7. The second uh, lesson or application is go beyond what is requ required. Read Matthew chapter 5, verse 47. Matthew 5, verse 47. And last, trust God with results. Read 1 Peter 2.23. That is 1 Peter 2.23. I trust that each one of you have a good week. Again, Chris, thank you for your leadership. Thank each one of you. I pray that God will keep each one of you safe this week. And may you truly be blessed in this time. Uh, as we face some rather difficult and unusual circumstances, something that I never dreamed that I would go through. Some of the things in the political processes in the world today that are shaping up just uh, are disturbing, but we should be praying for all this. So with that in mind, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, lead, guide, and direct us each and every day with every member of this Sunday school class and those anybody else listening. May you bless them, keep them in your hands, and keep them in the palm of your hands. And may we learn the lesson of radical love. And we'll give you the praise, the glory, and the thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good week. God bless you. Bye.